Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Nuanto YouTube channel. I am Kara Burrell. Sometimes I go by Nuanto. And this stranger over here to absolutely no one is Eve. After I worked at uh, Mormon Stories, me and John Dillon got back together and I brought Eve in, who was a really good sport. <laughs> and we made a YouTube video together, basically entitled Telling a Mormon About Joseph Smith and all of the truth that had been hidden from her. So that was a really popular video and people have been wondering what Eve has been up to. So Eve, how are you feeling? Are you excited to be here? I'm really nervous. My hands are very sweaty. So <laughs> just don't hold my hand. Well, Eve, you look beautiful. You look stunning. Thank you so much for doing this uh, interview part two with me again. It was obviously a really uh, difficult time for Eve to kind of sit through and listen to those kinds of things. And we're going to talk about what was happening before that interview, kind of what led up to it. And then what road she followed uh, post that interview. Does that sound good? Sounds like a plan. So if you have some questions for Eve throughout, uh, I might have to save a couple, but we'll definitely get everything answered by the end of this. Welcome to the Morning History Hotel. All right, girl, let's start it off like a Mormon stories interview, basically, is what I was thinking and anticipating for this. Uh, so much of faith and deconstruction starts with what type of Mormon you were, how you were raised, what you believed, and then that can kind of lead into what led up to you even being willing to sit down with me and more ex-Mormon Voldemort, <laughs> John <Dillon. laughs> and uh, and be able to listen to these things. And one of the things I know that people loved about that interview was a, how sweet and sincere that you were and people just fell in love with you. If you haven't seen that interview, I don't know what you're don't watch it. <laughs> of course, watch it. <laughs> but, uh, the link is, is down below if you haven't seen it, but it has about 500,000 views right now, but people from all different faiths and backgrounds all really feel like they saw themselves in you. You're very sweet and sincere and you ask very good critical thinking questions. John DeLynn mentioned in that interview that you can tell your dad's a lawyer and you have good analytical skills and ask, asked all the right kind of questions of like, where do I read this? How do I know that it's legit kind of stuff? Things that kind of go through everybody who was raised in a high demand religion when you're confronted with some new facts that might've been hidden from you your whole life in a systematic way. So why don't we start with you just kind of introducing yourself and why don't you kind of tell us what type of kind of family you were raised in, what your faith was like, and kind of take us up to the point of what made you feel like, yeah, I'll sit down with Kara and I'll hear some things that she might have to say because not everybody would be willing to do that. I grew up in Houston, Texas. It's not Utah, but when I went into high school, my parents made sure we moved into the area of Houston where all the Mormons were gathering. So the high school I went to, there were actually two seminary classes for each grade. It felt like as Utah, <laughs> Utah as you could get in Texas. Your family has always been extremely Mormon. Yeah, my yes. dad was a bishop when I was younger. My dad's parents converted to the church when he was like three. But on my mom's side, we have ancestors going all the way back to people who were first converted by the missionaries in Europe and then came over and were pioneers. So nice. it's a very long history of Mormonism on that side. Yeah, I completely believed everything. I it was, was revealed to you. Exactly. And I, looking back now, I am positive. I suffered from scrupulosity mm. and it's religious OCD, if you're not familiar with just having spiritual experiences throughout my life and feeling like it was a good thing. I, yeah, I felt like I had my own testimony. I mean, I mean, I went on a mission. So, so that leads into where me and Eve met. So tell me about anything that had to do with maybe going through the temple or, uh, serving your mission, like both good and bad. I would just like to hear what that experience imbued into your testimony. Sure. Honestly, I know a lot of people get weirded out by the temple and I've heard stories where people were like, what the heck? 
I don't know. It just didn't seem as weird to me as I know some people are have a really difficult time going through that. My mission was really difficult for me because I struggled <laughs> a lot with this concept of that the church teaches you you need to get married, have a family, and have kids, especially having the name Eve. Mother you of all living. <laughs> so those kids I honestly, part of the reason I went on a mission was like, I can say this looking back, but I hadn't gotten married yet. At 23. What? When did you get married, Kara? 19. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I had and already I was, had. I was late for me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I had already had friend groups. Like I, I had multiple friend groups where we were friends. They'd all get married. I'd right. have to get a new friend and group. Like, yeah. I saw this happening over and over again. BYU. And I decided I'm going to go on a mission. That's what I'm going to focus on right now. And, but even while I was on my mission, it was really difficult for me because everyone was so much younger. I always kind of felt like I was behind. Um, and at the very end, I almost went home a transfer early because I was just really stressed. And, and I, with moved the, and I wasn't there anymore. Like scrupulosity, there's so many rules on a mission. It's insane. Yeah. It's really hard to keep all of them, but I felt like I had to be perfect. So I just had a lot of pressure on myself. My anxiety went yeah. way up during my mission. Um, but I mean, overall, I had a good experience. There are things I look back on and... I see them a little bit differently now, but while I was going through it, I would say, yeah, it was a good experience. And especially meeting you, I was in Kara's area for nine months. Yeah. And if you don't know, a mission is 18 months. So, and you get switched around every six weeks. So I was in Kara's ward for most of my mission. And, so cool. and I had a great ward. Come on. And I was just like, I was always like in your corner on the mission. And so I moved uh, to go moved back to Utah, but we still kept in touch. And then Eve moved back to Utah. And, uh, so throughout your twenties, we just both remembered that we're in our mid thirties. We just remembered that. I thought I was, she 32. just remembered that <laughs> she forgot how old we were. Cause we're like a I month was, apart. Yeah. I thought I was 32 for like five minutes earlier. And then she's like, we're 34. And I was like, mm, 32, two years of my life just got sucked away. Uh, so tell me about, uh, what happened then what it was like dating, marrying your husband. You guys got married in the LA temple. Casey's the LA best. mission. He was my zone leader. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I came home. Yeah. I came home to Utah. I had one more semester left at BYU and I, my testimony was really good. There were just things that bothered me the way that uh, queer people are treated within the church was probably the biggest one, um, for me. And, but I would, I believed the church so much and it, it goes back generations, right? Like, yeah. and all these people I respect. And I just hoped that that was the one thing maybe the church got wrong. Obviously I now think there are a lot of other things, but I, believed and I just hoped that I mean it just felt wrong it felt wrong right, and it was retreated. just things I kept putting on my shelf right so so that weighed that kind of uh, aspect of the church's doctrine and theology weighed heavily on your shelf so how did you continue from there throughout your 20s um I became less worried about all the rules. I mean, I I feel like people watching this might laugh because when I say that, it's not like I became someone who broke every rule, but I wasn't as worried as uh, about eating out on Sundays. I had a group of friends who weren't LDS and we'd go out, they would go out drinking, we'd go out dancing, and I'd be the designated driver. So as around never to that point in your life. Just go through the rules of Mormonism for a second. You really, we probably hadn't really done anything. No, never drank coffee, never did any drugs or alcohol or anything like that. And so I was still very uh, 
strict in that way, but more subtle things. Um, Just eating out on Sunday is a big deal. Yeah, it sounds so silly now. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but they were big things for steps for me to take to take any sort of like uh, autonomy. Yeah, autonomy. Yeah, something. back over and feeling. And for me, I always felt like there's that one scripture that talks about how all blessings are predicated on obedience to certain commandments. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt like I needed to be exactly obedient. And exact obedience is something that was emphasized in a mission a lot. And so being able to break myself away from that, it's kind of like exposure therapy. Right. Yeah, I did the same kind of thing yeah. too, where I'm like testing, how do I feel when I don't wear my garments? Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm sorry, I mean, you were still wearing your garments. You're still oh, yeah. doing everything. Just small little tests of how do you feel when you're standing up and having a little more autonomy. From I left the church in 2019 before COVID was even a twinkle in our eye. Uh, but take me up until like when people stopped going to church and then how kind of your testimony was and, you know, what you what you believed, what you participated in, and then how you kind of viewed your life pre our interview. Sure. <laughs> there was one direction she was going in, and I will say the direction did change. I so my husband and I moved from Los Angeles, then we moved to Austin. And Kara and Era Air Aaron, Kara and Aaron actually came out and for Aaron's job and visited us a little bit. And it was right when you were first like what is happening because you had just visited your dad who had health issues and that like whole mega church story where you talked mm. to that dude and you were kind of like just ranting about everything was and I? yeah was i remember you? thinking i was like what is happening with kara i don't know what's going on like I'm talking i'm trying to remember this um you were telling me a bunch of stuff about the church that you just really didn't like where and were we we were in Austin. You came to oh, visit. Oh, I thought you were in, met in LA. Sorry. Go no, on. no. This is in Austin. And we went to like 6th Street and mm -hmm. we went paddle boarding on the river. Remember that? Mm -hmm. But I, we went to that one street in Austin and I was like, I'm going to have some alcohol. Alcohol for me. And then who knows what happened the rest of the night? Who knows what my motor mouth was up to? <laughs> so that makes sense. Okay, continue. Oh, yes. It was Lady Bird Lake paddle boarding. Someone mentioned. I was very surprised because I thought out of all my friends, you would be the least likely to leave. And that kind of hit me then. And for me, I don't know, because you were someone who was like close to me and close to my testimony. I think it helped open up a door to be like, OK, I need to take her concerns seriously. And I need to be open to listening to people who have concerns because even Kara has them. And so during COVID, we all took a break from going to church, right? It's like little things that start bringing your walls down, right? I had a child. We weren't going to church. And I also was thinking, like, what do I really want to teach this human? Yeah. And just reevaluating the things that I've been taught and the things that I'm going forward and teaching um, my kid. and. Like we would go back to church and I took him to nursery and um, all those things. I felt like, too, there were times where I had a couple conversations with you because I did find your TikTok account. And that was a big thing for me because it wasn't just Kara having a difficult time or leaving. It was her actively talking crap. <laughs> so and to me, that was a whole new level. And I'm like, wow, okay, I feel like I need to take these things more seriously. And so I did That's a really watch interesting some... reaction. What? Because I think most people uh, would not be as receptive to be like, I my friend has these serious concerns, like when I visited you. And, well, you know, if somebody that I trust uh, believes that the church that I believe in isn't as true as they thought it once was, kind of shaking that pillar. And that's one thing. And then... I, I could have just been like, oh, well, she's out there being the spawn of Satan. That's what ex-Mormons do. No, she left the church. You can't leave it alone and blocked. And I don't want to talk to her anymore because that's a reaction that a lot of people, I think, I don't know, that's kind of more normal to have. 
But Eve is such a sweetheart. She's like, I want to take these concerns seriously. Well, and I think too, it was like our relationship because there could be other people that I have known and I would have seen that and done what exactly what you said. Right. Mm -hmm. But I honestly feel like my, uh, my love for you and like our respect for our relationship kind of overpowered some of the conditioning that would tell me just ignore her, block her, don't talk to her anymore, which surprise, some of my friends have kind of done. So what you've just said, <laughs> the common thing that some of Eve's friends have done, unfortunately. So uh, the, yeah. So yeah, I think our, our relationship, especially when I'm known as like being a comedian and like, don't take anything I say too seriously. I'm trying to do it in a satirical way or a funny way, but to some Mormons, it can just come off as disrespectful no matter what, or, you know, when you shake somebody's faith and they have like a, a doubling down backfire effect, a lot of things could be going on, but I think Eve, knew me and that if she's such a Jesus freak when I knew her, uh, the direction that care is pointed in, we'll say eight times out of 10 is probably the direction that is semi on course. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just at least something to consider, but I never, I don't, I don't think I ever like pressured you or said anything no. to the effect of like, you need to listen to me. Have you read the CES letter yet? What's up with your Mormon stories playlist? You clicked play yet? But yeah, no. Eve, Eve and I, we only kind of sporadically talked throughout that time, but yeah, I was surprised. I didn't know that you had found like my TikTok up until the last interview with John Dolan when you told me that that was like the first time that you knew that I was making that content it was like it coming up on your for you page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On and I, well, and I texted you about it and you're like, oh yeah, I didn't want to tell you because you're already having a difficult time, which I was with postpartum OCD and anxiety and I was kind of like, why didn't you tell me, Kara? I think there was even a video up with me in it because you used pictures of missionaries, yeah. you with the missionaries. So I was like, what the heck, Kara? Why didn't you tell me what's going on? Um, and, you know, even with my I'll friends. Be on your YouTube channel, prime time only. Even with my friends who were posting things that sounded kind of conspiratorial during like COVID stuff, I wanted to engage them and have conversations and like, Find out like why do people believe certain things and how did they get to that thought process? And at that point, you know, there was something you sent me. And I remember because <laughs> I told you, I was like, I kind of want to understand like where your concerns are coming from and what's going on. And you sent me this video. I don't remember what it is or what it was, but it sounded almost along the lines of like Q stuff, like very conspiratorial and Something about like, me, the two claims of the church? I, I don't remember. I think it was something about the temple and about them like cutting their throats and all that stuff, mm. you know? And um, so Eve is referencing that pre-1990 when you went through the Mormon temple that you had these different uh, type of pantomimed blood oaths that you would pretend to you'd move your hand across your neck like this and your bowels and promise that you know you'll never reveal these signs and tokens lest you take your own life and then in 1990 they had uh did you know it was actually not done by prophecy it was actually done by a survey of why are mormons not going to the temple so much anymore and they said maybe take out those blood oaths they're getting kind of creepy so it's probably something that i sent you i'm like did you know that the temple used to be this way and it just sounded so creepy and i was like this sounds like really weird and I was just like, okay, Kara's just kind of crazy for a second. But yeah, I was just trying to understand p different people's points of views because it seemed like everyone was like yelling at each other. Um, and even if people have views that I very hardcore disagree with, but they were my good friends growing up. Like, I want to understand, like, how did you get to like, where is that coming from? So I feel like I kind of approached it that way with you, with the church stuff at first. And then as time went on, I was like, no, I think there's more to what she's saying. And I need to do more than just watch two minutes of a video that sounded conspiratorial E and Risk actually uh, confront what I might not want to see. So uh, Brisket and Rib asks, Wait, so did Eve not believe that the blood atonement happened in the temple? I didn't. I had never been told about that. 
And so, so when go... you said it to me, no, I was like, that sounds crazy. And so I didn't ask anybody else about it. It just like no one. I mean, when does that come up in conversation unless you're listening to Mormon stories or listen, like when you're in uh, the church, like no one's bringing that stuff mm -mm. up because it's not something they do anymore. Mm -hmm. And so there's and you don't talk about the temple outside of the temple. Right. So the only places you would have those conversations are like you're in the ceiling room or not the ceiling room, like the celestial room with your parents or whoever. And you're like, uh, I kind of maybe heard this thing. But I had never even heard it. So mm -hmm. especially when it's like the most sacred ceremony, I think in my most Mormon mind, too, if somebody were to tell me that that up until like 1928, you would swear an oath to avenge the death of uh, Joseph and Hiram Smith against the United States of America. And then they get those like what like you were telling me. Yeah, I might have told you that. Um, if somebody told me that I would honestly think in my most Mormon mind that we're talking about the, this very sacred temple ceremony that of course, Satan wants to get after. There's like a saying and a belief I had in Mormonism that you never say out loud when you're going to the temple, because something will always come up to prevent you from going to the temple. Like that's how much Satan is after you to not let you go to the temple. So I think in my most Mormon mind, I would have just been like, yeah, that's a crazy thing that somebody made up. So they can attack our most sacred temple ceremony. So people lose their faith in it. And I mean, I've had Mormons say that to me in my comment section over the last few, couple of years of making content. And my response is like, you commit your life to this church. You should know about what the covenants are, where they came from, how they've changed over the years. Cause they have, even though they say they haven't like, you can still say Mormon, just, you should know the history of your church and where all these things came from. And if you don't feel okay with doing these different ceremonies, if you don't feel like a lessening of your anxiety and don't feel protected, uh, then you should analyze what kind of relationship you want to have with the church and not just be told to keep going to it if it's not actually bringing you joy overall. And you could be, you know, ladling soup in a soup kitchen instead of cleaning $600,000 chandeliers that have been imported from Italy inside the temples. So there's just, you got options is all I'm saying, Mormons, you got options. So um, you uh, watch that video, you that I sent, you were trying to be empathetic and listening to various different friends you had. I remember you telling me that one of your companions on the mission left pretty soon after, and uh, you had you know, like a, a, a good empathetic heart to listen, uh, maybe doing as Christ would do. I don't know. I think you're pretty uh, equal at that stature from this interview thus far. Anyone in the comments disagrees, get out of here. If it is true, which I believed it was the absolute truth, then it should stand up to any criticism, right? So, like, I should be safe to learn addressing your yeah. concerns to some extent. And I think there is a good point. Yeah. this I, I've seen in some of the comments on the other video, and it's not most of them, but some people will be like, I can't believe she didn't know the history of her church. I can't believe she didn't know these things. And it's not like I was someone who was not going to seminary, was not going to uh, church, was I was doing all those things. I was a very devout member who I think was very intelligent, but there are things put in place that keep you from knowing those things. And why are you going to, how, where are you going to go and dig deeper when you're in the church and they keep you occupied with so many other things that like, I'm not going to go search out stuff that's content, that's considered ex-Mormon content to inform myself of things that I think are actually things that are just trying to get at the church. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. any of what I said just no, makes that sense. makes perfect sense. But yeah, you're in the church and you're happy and mostly, and the idea that you're going to go learn all the things that are contentious about the history. Yeah. That's, that's Mormonism why? 101. Yeah, why, why would a boat? happy Mormon do that? Like, Especially when no you're reason. like, what the curriculum is, what the church tells you is what you learn in Sunday school, everything else. You get into that kind of territory of apologetics and church history, how the Book of Mormon was actually translated. There's just a bajillion different subjects that you just, you know, you just read the scriptures. If the prophets say that the Book of Abraham is true, then it's true. I don't know, need to go looking into the history of why some people don't think that it's true. That's where I got to the point where I wanted to see when my husband started leaving the church. I was like, okay, my therapist asked me, one day, very poignant question. He's like, what are, what are his problems with the church? And I was like, honestly, I don't know because he doesn't want to tell me and I don't want to ask. 
And we went like that for a long time. And then I finally one day was like, what are ex-Mormons issues? Like, why do people actually leave the church besides, I was very conservative. So besides like all of the liberal reasons, like why do people not like the church? What are their arguments? And I watched a video about the book of Abraham and it was uphill from there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Cause sometimes you don't even know what their arguments are until you're like, my husband's leaving. I don't want to talk to him, but I want to know, read the same things that he's reading. Yeah. Yeah. And so after watching that video, I opened myself a little bit more gradually to watch some of your other videos. And there was a point where I had concerns and I would try and talk to people who I thought, well, I still think they're very intelligent people, but who are kind of more progressive in their views in the church. Like they're still in, right? But they have, they're considered progressive and I feel like they're intelligent people and I would bring up some of the concerns I had, but every single time I had these conversations with people who were still in the church, at some point I always felt a wall go up. Mm -hmm. That was like, but this is also true. Like there was something that was keeping people from like going to a step where it could be possible that it's not true. And I had multiple conversations with my husband. It, I was so scared because I knew the road I was going down. I had to get to a point where I said, if it's not true, I need to accept that. And approaching that in a marriage where he was my zone leader, we got married in the temple, yeah. like we didn't really talk about these things is something that's really scary because you think – the way people are conditioned, you don't know if that's, and if that's what you built your marriage upon, like, where is the breaking point for people? And that's not like com conversations that you just we had had. you're going to stay Mormon forever. You know? Yeah. So I had to slowly kind of start having these conversations and coming, like inching myself to a place where I could truly say, like, I am open to what the actual truth is even if that truth means everything that is the way I know it is not the way I know it, which was terrifying to me and means that like, I don't know how my family will re react. I don't know how my husband will react. I don't know like what life will be like going forward with like my closest relationships. So I had kind of inched myself that way. And when I came out to Utah last year. I wanted to see you because I wanted to have some of these conversations with you. I thought it would be really important to do that because I had ha already had conversations with people who are progressive but still in, and I wanted to have conversations with people who had left. Right. So, and then you were like, well, we could do this thing if you want. And I decided I was like such a long shot hail mary ask i was like hypothetically speaking i have this episode planned with john delin we were planning on filming it this week you are a believing mormon i know you have you know some doubts we want to talk about this what if hear me out we did it on camera and five hundred thousand people watched it over the course of the next year tell me your thoughts so i was really surprised that you was like yeah let's do it well yeah. i had conversations with my husband i was like right I'm going to go do this thing. Are you comfortable with me doing that? And he was very um, encouraging and told me that if that was something I wanted to do, I should. And I remember Carrie even gave me the list of questions that she and John were going to tell me beforehand. And she said, if you want to read these, like, if that will help you feel better, like, you should read them because I don't want you... I just want you to do this the way that feels most comfortable to you. But I really wanted to capture that moment in time because I knew there's only one time where I would have not heard the things that she was saying and that I would be finding them out. And I wanted that to be very genuine because I think that's a unique thing. And you saw that that was a very unique thing that totally. like, when are people going to have this conversation on camera where other people who may be in a similar situation can look at that and see themselves in that um in that spot and i just thought that was really important and 
I've had some people kind of question, like, why did you go on there and let them just like grill you? And like, it sounded like they people were kind of life, attacking right? you. And yeah, people yeah. in my life come and say that to me and they don't know the dynamic of our relationship, the trust that I, I had. established that at the beginning. They don't know, yeah, like, like you're a stranger to them. Yeah. You're not a stranger to me. You had given me the questions. Like I was very conscious knowing how painful that experience could be. would be. And I did that because I wanted to. It wasn't, I was not being taken advantage of. And some people have implied that. And it has made me a little bit upset, but mm -hmm. it's okay. Yeah. It's, it's, even though it's difficult, me and John mentioned at the end of that video that, you know, you wouldn't just walk up to somebody on the street and shake them out of their faith and be like, stand here, listen to me for one hour. And I demand that you answer me about what you think about Joseph Smith having dozens of plural wives, you know, but it, John Delin's like, this is your dear friend. You have this relationship and like in other circumstances, that'd be kind of strange and unethical, but our relationship, I knew that no matter what happened, like you wanted to be able to have that conversation and you can do with that information what you wanted to. We, we stated repeatedly that like where the sources are, you can read about these things. You can fact check us. Don't take our word for it. And like overall, Eve was like receptive and resistant and like kind of walking a fine line between like, I believe you, but all right, let me see. I want to hear the stories of these women, you know, and I think what got across more than anything was just that like, this is a, a person who is a genuine, like just normal person who is, who is seeking after truth, who has been brought up in this high demand religion. Some might call it a quote or, or some might call it a, a cult. And in real time, it's like a genuine, sincere person who is interacting with some, some information in front of our eyes and kind of watching the things go through your brain of like, hold on a second or gross. I didn't know that. Or, you know, how would I feel? How would you feel if your husband took 22 wives before even telling you, you know, like, yeah, you just, you don't often get that on camera, but people from all different religious backgrounds, I felt like really related to that. Cause we all go through that privately, sometimes with our, in our heads, with our friends or with our spouses or whatever. There's just a very unique capturing that moment in time. So isn't even credible for doing that with us, like the coolest thing ever. It sounded like it was all genuine things that you had never heard before. And we're talking about like Joseph Smith having up to 20, 20 plus plural wives, crowning himself king of the world, losing his marbles, burning down the printing press. Uh, basically, William Law, first presidency member, outing Joseph Smith for his polygamy and basically sex polyandry and the polyandry, things like that. That um, and and kind of the reasons that led up to Joseph Smith's death. Because those are you, you believe in your prophet so much, and you believe that he was a martyr for the cause, and that he sealed his testimony with his blood. That he was like a lamb to the slaughter. And so I think this is that was part of a three part series that me and John did. And so that one really encompassed the end of Joseph's life and kind of what led up to it that your testimony sometimes is so involved with him sealing his blood as a martyr. So it's a difficult, you know, a heavy episode because so many Mormons depend on Joseph Smith dying for that cause. So if there was anything from that episode that you kind of remember sticking out to you as stuff you wanted to research or particularly like if this is true if what they're saying right now in this mormon story studio is true i'm going to be done or what were your kind of feelings going through that interview at that time um i it it was devastating to me i had always kind of i had always had issues with polygamy and finding out with about polyandry was especially difficult to me. And that was one thing I really needed to like understand and understand why that would be. Was that the first time you heard that Joseph Smith was marrying? That was like, the first time I had ever heard the wives. word polyandry. Yeah. I, yeah, I'll, it was mostly the polygamy stuff because they don't talk. They kind of try and skirt by that. I, I mean, now with the what do you call them? They've been more open about things with what are those things called? The gospel topics, gospel essays, topics essays and stuff. But when we were kids, that was something they just skirted around. And there was always this a little bit of villainization of Emma Smith. Um that I was rigid bitch. That I that I was very uncomfortable with. Then I went home to 
talk a little bit with about some of this stuff with my husband. Um, and just to find more stuff out, I started listening to Year of Polygamy podcast. Um, Highly recommend. And the then a little ways into that, this was like within days of doing the interview, I read Letter to My Wife. And I had not watched, I had watched like maybe one Mormon Stories podcast before going on Kara's um, thing. And I started watching more of that. But a letter to my wife, when I read that, that was like the night I was just like, I'm done. Do you want to explain what that is or do you want me to explain it? Um, You can explain it. So if you've heard of the CES letter, which is a document written by Jeremy Reynolds, and it's a collection of some of the most problematic truth claims and a compilation of everything from why is the book of Abraham look like it's a fraud? Why is this you know, just a list of, I guess, maybe 20 different things from Mormon history that don't make any sense. And letter to my wife is, is like the CES letter, but um, in a lot of ways, I like it even more. And you can Google it right now. It's a really sweet, sincere letter. And when we're talking about these things about possibly your family disowning you, it's very, very serious and high demand religions like this. But if you can come to them with like, I have these facts. I did this research. Here's my evidence. And so there's a man, I don't actually know his name, but he put together a similar document called letter to my wife and wanted to research all of these topics and say, this is what we're taught in the church, but this is what the evidence actually shows about Justinus polygamy or the book of Abraham or kinder hook plates, 20 different things at least. And you can go through the website now that it's posted. And it's just a really sweet, sincere, like heartfelt letter. And he, this man also posted on Reddit that, yes, he gave the letter to his wife and they are now divorced. And that's what sometimes does happen. So letter to my wife is a good one if you're interested in more of these uh, Mormon history kind of truth claims. So you read that and it was kind of devastating and shook you. Yeah, I decided I was done. I And you read it how soon after our interview? Just like a few days. Wow. And I remember texting my, I was, so I was the Relief Society Activities Coordinator. And so this was in October and we had an activity, like a Christmas activity that I was going to do. And I planned the Christmas activity and I went to that. But I told the person in the Relief Society presidency, I was like, please tell the bishop I'm not coming back to church. Please tell them I don't want visiting teachers. Please do all of this because I had just moved. And so it was a pretty new ward. So it was easier to step back from it for me. Um, but yeah, I just like did not want to have all those conversations with all those people. And I told my husband that I couldn't do it. I didn't want to go back. And he was okay with that. And he supported me. And... Yeah, but it was really, it was, it was, it was difficult because I had just moved. Um, if it had been COVID, I had had a baby. I felt so lonely. And the one place I knew like where to find community was within the church. And I felt like I had been starting to build that up a little bit. There was a group of moms that I had been starting to make friends with and hang out with, but I felt that I needed to cut those relationships because I knew if I would go to a play date with a bunch of moms who were still believing and I was going through all of this and was a little bit angry at the time that it would not be good vibes. It would not be good vibes. So I, yeah, it felt like I got cut off from any community that I had and friends and it was really difficult. But another thing I wanted to mention about like part of the reason I went on the podcast was because I or your YouTube video, I knew I had these questions and I knew that the audience who would watch would not be the people I was scared of seeing the video. The very devout religious people who are staying completely away from it. any anti-Mormon content that they don't even know it exists probably. And I knew that what might happen is I might find people from my friends or acquaintances who also had similar um, concerns who didn't feel like they could talk about it just like I didn't and that they might reach out to me <laughs> and 
like I put you through hell and you're like took the rug out from underneath you but she did it because she's like at least other people who might be in a similar circumstance will feel seen and heard we may love you so much That's well so that but I it was also a little bit a little bit selfish because I wanted to hear from them because I wanted to I could have done it off camera but. hear from people uh, well I mean but if I didn't tell everybody I was having these issues people who didn't feel comfortable speaking yeah when it text me wouldn't direct message me wouldn't um reach out to me because they in some cases they are feeling the same thing they haven't told anyone about their questions they like maybe just their spouse um or not even i yeah so after that video went up um it started getting views a lot faster than i ever would have thought me too and yeah. i started having Every day for at least two weeks, I had a new person reaching out to me and being like, oh my gosh, Eve, you're in this situation. Me too. Are you or, talking about, you know, like people from your mission, all kinds of backgrounds? Yeah. People who are like faithful. Who, acquaintances, people yeah. from different jobs that I've had that like we barely knew each other. Um, yeah. A lot of people were people that I was just more like acquaintances, but we followed each other on social media for different reasons. But one thing that was really, really helpful to me was I did have um, a pair of friends. We weren't super close in high school, but they got married. And so they're a husband and wife. And I hadn't talked to them since high school, but they reached out to me because they were a little bit further along this path of deconstruction than I was, but like barely. Um, and we got on Marco Polo and we talked almost every day for three months. So cool. Wow. Yeah. And honestly, I felt so alone at that time. Like, and I've told them this and we don't talk as much anymore, but I appreciate them so, 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 so much. If I had been going through all of that, like by myself, it would have been so much more difficult, but to have someone, especially someone who grew up in the place I grew up and experienced that same, almost same life that I did in Mormonism, because it's different everywhere you live, even ward to ward. Um, and we were in the same ward. And so having them was so, 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 so helpful. And I'm so grateful to them. If they Shout watch this, friends. love you. And so did they just come across your, the YouTube video? Yeah. So that Saw was what was happening with your face like this. So yeah, a lot of people were just coming across the video and then started messaging me and they were one of the people who did. Um, and then they were like, Hey, let's Marco Polo and talk about how crazy this is and our questions and stuff. So it was super helpful to have them during that. And I started watching a lot of Mormon stories. I watched the LDS discussions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, I watched a lot of, listened to a lot of stuff. Um, there was even times where I listened to some like stuff from, I think, Faith Matters. I tried to listen to some things that were a little bit more apologetic, but it was really difficult for me. <laughs> To listen to that so couldn't put the toothpaste back in the tube as they yeah say. yeah there was just like this point where i saw things and then when i started hearing like conference clips or just things that people are sharing or stuff from the church that you usually would have made me feel good like i heard things differently it's like there's something that switched in my brain and i could see the spiritual manipulation um, that was happening to me and a lot of people. The spiritual manipulation, meaning like people trying to spin apologetic arguments where you're well, just like, this doesn't make any sense. And I know it doesn't. Yeah. And just, I don't know how to explain it, but even the fact of like trying to keep you away from people who have different opinions, like that's huge. And not telling you the full narrative of everything and just, that's just wrong. Anytime someone's trying to tell you not to listen to someone, especially if they're your friends or family who have left the church, like that is wrong. 
if you have the truth, it can stand up to whatever concerns people have. And it's okay for people to live differently than you are living. So anyway. Yeah. I remember you saying that in the interview where you just kind of wanted to be open. It's like just really wanting to be opposite of, of this dogmatic all in type of thinking, being open to new ideas and stuff. Yeah. I just, I don't ever want to get to a place where I can't listen to someone else's point of view, even if I think they're completely wrong because it's okay to have conversations with people and it's okay to change your mind. I just want, and it's easy for us to put up walls to keep us in the world that we're living in and what we know is safe and what we think is the tr like truth, but we should be able to take in new information and adjust our points of view and people should be allowed to change their minds. So not in Mormonism, not when you, uh, <laughs> Covenant to give all your time, talents, and resources to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Wear the holy underwear for the rest of your life. Would you, like we ended that podcast, like, do you wish that you would have known these things before you served a mission? Do you wish that, you know, your investigators would have been made aware of these different aspects? Do you think that people are entitled to know these types of things? And who wouldn't say, of course they are, right? I love you, Lisa. I love you so much. Uh... Cults of Consciousness said, hi, Kara. Hi, Eve. Thanks for being brave and sharing this personal information live. Remember to be kind in the chat, everyone. These are hard conversations. The interview that we did together was really meant to be. And there's commentary from the haters who are like, you guys are, whether they accuse me and John of spinning things and only giving you know the most uh, like abrasive ex-Mormon take that we were filling your head full of lies or something like that. I mean, we've been accused of all of those kinds of things where you're just like cornering you in the studio and, and forcing you to listen to us. And a lot of different accusations were made of me and people were saying different things about you. Like, Oh, you know, poor Eve. And she was kind of being bullied into sitting there and stuff. But I do believe that it was a real interesting like provocation and really meant to happen um, for that. It all kind of strangely came together and, uh, I'm happy that it did. And it's just a really, the, me and John are always trying to think of ways as content creators to get out, you know, more informed consent, more information to people capture really interesting Mormon stories interviews or do like the LDS discussion things. And it's just a really interesting premise to be able to have somebody willing to sit down and listen to those things and kind of deconstruct on camera in a way where 500,000 people on YouTube now have <laughs> more information about Mormonism than they had before and that I believe is completely sourced with, you know, LDS sanctioned sources, historical sources that are legitimate, that anybody worth their salt would also agree that the, the facts that we stated in that video were not spun just to, you know, tear down Eve's faith and then be like, good. Now you're in our ex Mormon cult and give us all your money. That's another accusation we get. I'm just, I'm really happy that you were so willing and receptive to be in that situation and everything kind of came together and now half a million people are more informed about Mormonism than they were before. So it's not just clickbait. It's, it delivers on it too. I was so scared to tell my parents that you did the video or that. Yeah. I remember in my family, because I saw the views going up and I was like, well, I don't think they're going to see this, but if they see it, they should hear it from me first. But that was just another whole level of it, it was like, uh, do I share this with my family? Do I not? So I did tell my family about it and I told, I texted it to them. Some of them have watched it. Some of them haven't. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's just crazy to me. If you think back on it, like we're in this thing where like your family won't even watch it because they've been told to not watch these things but it's you like they love you they know you're a good person they're but some people uh, everyone's in different places in their lives but the fact that we were in this organization that made it so that we can't even listen to like a conversation that our family member has with another person like it's the empathy that you yeah. would ex you know because what, what's difficult for me is when like i s try to have empathy and you expect other people that they would show that same level of empathy that you're showing towards them. So like the ways that you were receptive and you would listen to somebody else, like you've mentioned 
throughout this interview, this podcast. And when other people that are close to you, they're like, screw it. Absolutely not. Like they don't have that same type of empathy to, to be able to be receptive and listen to what your problems might be now. There is one caveat to that is that I do understand that because like I had to face these things where it's like, does this like affect my marriage to how does this affect my family? Like I totally understand people who need to protect their, like if they're in situations where they feel like going down that road would dissolve relationships that they're not ready. I don't, there's just so many different situations. Like I can understand people. I don't want to just yeah, rag don't, on my don't. family or anyone who hasn't watched the video. Cause I understand they're, we're all in different spots and it's just, yeah, it's more just an explanation. Yeah. Let me investigate this. And it's sometimes just for, I want to be informed, but your brain subconsciously knows it's like also a bitch. You know, there's something unhealthy, right? You want to be on the right <laughs> side of it. Let's get informed, but like also get on the right side of this. Yeah. So I tell me, uh, uh, let's talk about one of the aspects of like some of the best things that have happened and then some of the worst things that have happened since, I don't know, how would you describe where your faith in Mormonism is at right now? So since you got to whatever, I'll let you speak that sentence where you're at and then what, what came out, what are the good pros and cons? Uh, I don't believe in Mormonism. <laughs> there you go. I am do not consider Can myself mean, a Mormon. Balloons. Uh, yeah. I one of the best things I think that has happened, and it's crazy. There's so many things you don't think you're thinking, but then you look back when you change your thought process and you see the things that you were thinking, and you're like, that was messed up. But what there's just this like superiority complex in Mormonism because you're taught that you have the thing that every single other person needs and is going to save them. And you don't feel like I never felt like I felt like I was superior to anyone. I didn't feel like if you had asked me that as a Mormon, I would have said no. And but there just is, there is this underlying tone, underlying tone that is taught to you from a very young age that you are special. You have the things that everyone else needs. Um, I wrote in my notes, it felt a little bit like, I don't know if y'all have seen the new Netflix movie, Leo with Adam favorite. Sandler. It's so good. Um, it felt like that scene where Adam Sandler is singing to that blonde girl. You're not that girl. I love, I love, oh gosh, have we talked about this yet? I, I like looked on my Instagram story the other day. Cause I watch it like every night with my kids and it's the funniest kids movie I've ever seen. Absolutely amazing. And then the message is amazing too. And he sings to a little so girl. Good. Don't cry. It's really annoying. <laughs> Don't cry. Don't shed a tear. He's like, we all have things that we're all stuck with lines like that. And I'm like, kids, you paying attention? Like we all got problems. And it's funny because it's about like a really clingy girl whose parents got divorced. And he's like, suck it up. You're ugly when you're crying. Oh, the, yeah. no, the one I'm talking oh, about no. is the dentist girl. The, her dad's like the dentist and they're all like thinking she's hot stuff. And she's like, the oh, best you're one not that class. special. You're not that great. And eh, they're both the same. Kind it's of okay. Though. And it's like, I can't remember how that one goes, but yeah. It's okay to be not that great. That's like, interesting that that song like meant something in terms of Mormonism with you. Because my husband has mentioned that a lot too, where you really feel like as a priesthood leader, you're out there to save the world and you have something special. And well, that's just, what you do as missionaries. Yeah. And it's okay. And I really felt this kind of drop into the human family. I don't know how else to explain it, but it was like, I thought I had something that people needed, that I needed, that everyone needed. And then I realized we're all kind of just trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And we're, it's okay to be not the person who has all the answers because it's scary going from a space where you feel like you have so many answers to a place where you feel like you have none. Yeah. Um, and it, but it was also so like I've never felt more connected to everyone else on earth than I had in those moments, even for how much the church preaches. We're all children of God. We should love each other. And we're all this like spirit family. But as soon as I 
decided to leave that, that's when I felt more connection to everyone than I, I ever know. had in my Isn't entire that life. So unique. Yeah. I hear that a lot. And it's just this beautiful coming home to humanity. Of like we're all trying to figure it out. Like we have that Buddhist philosophy of just like suffering, uh, like holding too tightly to these ideas. It's just like the root of so much suffering and like true happiness will come when you just recognize how much you don't know, not holding too tightly to any kinds of outcomes. And that's the opposite of what Mormonism kind of teaches. That's where the scrupulosity comes in. You're just like, mm, feels good just to not know things. But then again, so it's kind of like a, a, a plus and a minus at the same time. So have you struggled with what we all kind of go through of like, okay, well, now I don't know anything. And it's, it kind of does feel like the Truman Show. There's a lot of nihilism people go through. And uh, like, a, what does anything matter anymore? What's the point of living? Um, I mentioned in my last live stream about how I had a friend um, who took her own life last week. And so that's like a, it's a very, very real topic. And people sometimes get into these highly depressive episodes and without some type of faith in a God that, you know, is looking out for you and has a plan for you, it can get really dark sometimes. So if there's anything around that that you want to talk about, or maybe not, maybe you want to move on. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was really difficult. And I think there was a period where I did feel a lot of despair just not knowing, but I've worked myself into a place where I feel like I just feel more peace in not knowing. Just it's okay to not know. And there are still times where I feel like my life, I'm like in the twilight zone or something because I never thought that I would leave the church and that I would do some of the things I've done. Or that my, I just thought my life was going in a different way. And it's not like it changes it that it it's crazy because it doesn't change it that much, but it changes it a lot, like subconsciously. And yeah, it was difficult. I did read uh, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. I love that book. And the podcast and from, right. yeah, she, Kara actually got me to read that before I, I even so went fun. on your uh, yeah, it was way back thing. Yeah, when I was still pregnant. And I loved it. And she told me, listen to this. And I loved all of it, even as a Mormon. Yeah, and I, I was deconverted so much it. by Bill Real. I credit with like my number one person who helped me deconstruct who I just feel like I owe my life to Bill Real. And one of the things he mentioned in one of his podcasts was this Eckhart Tolle. A series that he did with Oprah that you can download right now on any podcast streaming app, really easy to listen to. And they answer calls from listeners about how to apply these things. And then New Earth, you know, it's on audiobook. And it uh, it really helped me in some of my darkest times deconstructing, uh, you know, reframing things in uh, just a more mindful, meditative way and a new way to look at the earth, you know, a new way to look at a new earth. And I remember reaching out. And then you said that you and your dad started reading it together. And mm -hmm. I was like, I'm so happy when you recommend a book and it really does good things. And I think John Dillon, every time I bring that up that I credit Bill Real, I think John Dillon always goes, you know, I told Bill Real to read that book too. So it started. Well, thank you, John. It goes, thank you, Bill. It goes down this thing of ding, ding, Oprah, John Dillon, Bill Real, Eve, Eve's dad, you listeners who haven't read it yet. It's really helpful stuff. So yeah, I think that really is like a breath of fresh air after a deconstruction. And it, yeah, it helps you just find, I think it brings a lot of peace. Yeah, I used it. Sometimes it still scares me not knowing, but there's this thing from, I think it's from stoicism that you contemplate your own like mortality and death. And it seems kind of scary, but it brings you more peace. And I feel like I do that. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, <laughs> tend to lead more towards science. I don't feel like I'm in this nihilism vortex that's mm -hmm. destroying my soul. Mm -hmm. And happy. maybe that's for good. some people it doesn't destroy their soul, but I do feel like a lot of people, it's really difficult when they go into that, right? Yeah. I had a strong nihilism phase and I think that it's kind of an important journey. If you look at life as like a journey, it's like a, a chapter in the book to kind of know how dark things can get, but still find peace in going from such a, like we talked about an absolute 
of knowing for sure that something is true to like knowing for sure that nothing is true and not everything is meaningless. And it's like, you could disappear tomorrow. And then I remember having a lot of peace thinking about how, like, um, I had a, I had a background on my phone once and it was this picture of a cat and I just put a caption on it that said three words to inner peace, not my problem. And that really helped me of like, what is my family going to think? What am I, all of these things, everything that made me so anxious about deconstructing. It's like, it's not my problem. You need to get through the day. It's not my problem. And I remember thinking in a thousand years, nobody will remember any of this and I'll be warm food and I'm happy about that. And that's what like kind of calmed me down that none of this is like that big of a deal. Like everything feels like every movie you make when you're Mormon is such a big deal because somebody's watching and it's hard to shift out of that, that lizard skin. But that old saying that like, how do you find the meaning of life? It's like you live life and you find meaning within it. And something okay. I think is really yeah. special about all of that is like, I feel like I've come to value every day and every moment I have with the people I love to a higher degree because I don't, I do feel like I do not know everything and I don't think anyone really knows what happens when we die, obviously. But if it is like contemplating these things, if it is just, that's it. That's what people have been going through since the beginning of time, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be okay. And that means I can treasure these moments all the more because they're special. And I know that I have this moment right now. And I found myself thinking, like looking back on myself in Mormonism, living a lot for the next life and for eternity, doing all the things that I need to do so that my family can be together forever someday. And you sometimes put off the present, which is what we know we have right mm -hmm. now for the hope of another life. So that's right where I try and find peace in that. Mm -hmm. I also really like that Netflix show about the mushrooms. What's oh, it called? is it Fantastic Fungi? Yeah, oh. it's so good. You are, I love you so much. Leo, you and should Fantastic watch Fungi that. are like the two best yes, things on that watch entire Fantastic platform. And Leo. Yeah, Fantastic Fungi is a fantastic movie and explains the mycelian network of mushrooms and just how things are so much more interconnected. Like we mentioned, when you move out of this phase of thinking that you're kind of elect and special in this chosen few, like, oh, I'm so lucky that I was born into a righteous family and I have this responsibility to teach and preach these things. I can never doubt this testimony because I'd be giving up on everything that I'm so special to be in these last days to be part of this true church. When you put, I mean, shirk off that responsibility and get to the real deal. Like I have responsibility to like heal my generational trauma, <laughs> responsibility to like love my family the grass is greener where you water it and just invest in in the time that I have and the resources and tools that I have here. I just wanted to respond to one comment. Someone said, LOL, all ex-Mormons love mushrooms. I've never actually tried mushrooms. I know. Just I so didn't even know. ask you because I knew that you didn't. You can see. enjoy watching Fantastic Fun Guy without yet. So let me respond to a couple of these super chats and uh you contemplate if you want to go in the direction that you know that I want to ask you about. <laughs> okay. Uh, Christina said, always appreciate your content. Oh, that's my friend. Yay. Hi, Christina. Oh, good. Thanks for the 20 bucks. It helped. It's helped me in my own journey, Eve. You're amazing for being vulnerable and sharing your story. She's so, from LA. Uh, so for one, you mentioned that some people in your life that watched the video that we did with John DeLynn it's obviously got a lot of views. It's popular. It's going to get out there and people close to you who are very Mormon. So one of my favorite parts of your faith deconstruction journey are people that are close to you in your life. We can call them family members, just, you know, friends, friends who took kind of, yeah, an interested empathetic approach and listened to it. And then you came to me and kind of told me what happened after that. And I was really like, surprised that people had that kind of reaction. So is there anything else you want to say about like good reactions from friends and family that surprised you within the church and them investigating and doing their own research and where people who started, you know, with the, the liftoff happened at that interview for them. 
Yeah, I I did share the video with people I was close to because I wanted them to hear about it for me and not from just finding it on YouTube. And yeah, that I didn't think would it would like change their mind and they are on a very different path now be after having taken time and I think it's honestly doing the thing I feel like I did with you. I feel like my love and respect for you broke through the conditioning and like we've already said, allowed me to actually consider your, it, take information from you and consider it and not put up a wall to not ha have the possibility that it changed that it changes my worldview. And I think one thing that helped some of the people who are close to me reconsider their worldviews was watching a video that was an hour and a half and it was someone they loved and respected. And it wasn't a conversation where we could argue points. They had yes. to just sit and listen to me and really consider the things that were being said. And that's what I think is so important about like the work that Kara does or about being vulnerable and like sharing our experiences online is, is because it's a way that you can reach people who have opposing views to you that you could not in any other way. Because when you're having direct conversations with people, people are thinking about how am I going to respond to this? What am I reacting to this? Are they going to think I'm stupid because I said this? Are they going to, what do they actually think about me? But when you're removed and you can watch a video and there's no one there judging your reaction, you can let down those walls and you can consider information in a way that just doesn't get through when you're having conversations. Because they care about you and they want to finish it to the end. And yeah. in that, yeah, they're going to be able to have to listen to some things. They might disagree or they might want to go research it later. But it's so interesting, like you said, that they can't, you know, argue like it would be. You can't shut down the conversation. They can't walk out. They want to finish it because they love you and yeah, end up on a much different journey than they would have anticipated their life would be even if they've been in the church for a long time, just based on like their love for you, Eve, as a, as a person, as a friend, as a family member, it's just so incredible that I never would have expected. Yeah. So many people in your personal life, like friends and family and that are in the chat right now or whatever, that, that, that spawned such I, spawn always has a negative connotation to me. Bird sounds creepy birthed. Um, just so much. Yeah. New light and love. Um, just from one video where people who love you were able to listen quietly, empathetically, intelligently, analytically. So I, I love that part of your story. And maybe some years in the future, we can talk more about like the specifics of those things. Cause that's, that's one of the things that just makes my heart burst with um, the, the good outgrowth that has come from people in, in our inner circle. So I love that. And yeah, I wish well, maybe in years to come, those people can come on my my I'm calling this what should we call when I do interviews like this more woman stories any comments any questions more women what is so it Mormon me? stories more woman stories oh okay more man stories you get it uh I get it I now. didn't know I needed to explain it I'm sorry I you know. can cut that out just cut to me laughing uh -huh. <laughs> this is always a hard one to kind of answer because everybody once you leave Mormonism, they want to know what your relationship is with God and Jesus Christ. But I think Eve kind of answered that a little bit earlier that things are, you know, complex and she's on her own journey to figure those things out. So, um, Alistair, thanks for the 10 bucks. Thanks for the super chat wrote, can you ask Eve now? She isn't convinced that the LDS church is now. She isn't convinced that the LDS church is not true. I think that was a double negative, but I get you. Is the obvious conclusion that God doesn't exist or would it be better question to ask what is true Christianity? Can you decipher anything? I, don't know um, to respond to? I would say the Mormon church makes you feel like you got to share, share with the world, everything that you believe. And that is something that I am deconstructing in and of itself. So 
Like you always have to be like, I believe this and I'm firm on yeah, this. Yeah, I need to Being stand up for thing. my beliefs and I need to proselytize to people and I don't feel like I need to do that. But yeah, that's my answer. That's a perfect answer. There are so many different things that need to be analyzed that go into what you want to build your life on. And Eve, now that that interview has kind of rocked your testimony in what you thought was something that was a lot more of a sure foundation. And as many different comments on this stream have said, and in the comment section below, people have just been like applauding your bravery to be able to do those things, feeling very validated. So Eve, a lot of things you've said before, a lot of jokes, a lot of things have been said about your name, but how does it feel to truly be the mother of all faith crises. No, okay. But does it feel to be, has it uh, truly like, it's, it's just so, um, it's just so cool to, to know you and I kind of have this very strange journey online with so many strangers where like, I'm in this online space and I feel like I brought you into it. And it's like, you know, everybody in the comment section, I just feel like loves you and sees themselves in you feel very validated no matter what their faith background is and stuff. So my last and final kind of question that is just how has this been receptive to like, I don't know, your your life, your emotional state kind of being in this, uh, being having that interview up there forever. Can't put a, put a gun to my head. I won't take it down. But what does it feel like to just kind of be entering into the space where people have kind of deconstructed so publicly with you? I know you've read a lot of the comments. Is there anything else just like as we kind of start to wrap up what you want to say about um, how brave and badass you are? Well, thank you. Uh, that comment about my name is interesting because I do. I'm like, how do I feel about my name now that I, yeah, well, like I won't get all into it. But I do feel like Eve had to partake of knowledge she was told not to partake of, right? And I feel like that's kind of what I've done. Like, I, really I feel like more connection. I, I feel ironic? connection to that. Um, yeah, I just, I, there are times that are difficult because of like the lack of community and just dynamics with other friends and family members that have been difficult uh, as I've left. But honestly, I feel a lot of hope and I feel a lot of excitement. Like the world kind of has this newness. And I think something that's really important for my mental health state is cultivating a sense of awe Mm. in things and there's kind of this awe in the world now that is new because I'm Famous. not so scared of certain things and I can trust myself and my decisions fully without looking to anyone else and someone telling right. me yes no you can't do that it's just like all up to me I feel like. And she's not even awesome. gone off the deep end or anything. So Mormons shut your mouth. <laughs> she's, she's still got like that sweet sincereness. Like I have I, tried I, alcohol. She's tried it. She had a sippity sip once. Wow. Have we ever done any sins together besides this podcast? I don't think so. Yeah. Tomorrow night though. Lake effect. I'm going to get <laughs> crunk. Oh, see us tomorrow night downtown Salt Lake. Getting crunk. Yeah, I think that... What I hope people understand it's just there is a certain type of yeah, like sweet, sweet, like genuine empathy that I've always known has been within you. And like that was born out on your mission and the ways and the constructs that the church will utilize it for their good. And some some of that's good, some of that is bad. But now being in a space where you can love people unabashedly and not feel so constrained with who you love and what decisions you make and like you're you're your brain, your logic, your empathy that got you kind of through Mormonism kind of led you out of Mormonism. And I still think that you are a fantastic mom, fantastic friend, fantastic person. Before I was doing this, I had a really difficult time postpartum being diagnosed with like postpartum anxiety and postpartum OCD. And it you was through it. Yeah. One no. of the lowest points of my life. And I started this Instagram called Reclaiming Mom Brain. And I had started that like right before I did this interview with Kara. And I kind of threw it to the side. You mean a year ago, right? Yeah. yeah. And like dove deep into deconstruction and put that on the back burner. 
But I feel like this year, 2024, I need to spend a little less time in the deconstruction and more time moving forward. And if you want to follow me on Reclaiming Mom Brain, that would be fun. Um, I just think there's so much about maternal mental health that isn't spoken about. And I, there's some crazy statistic that's like 75% of women who go through these different maternal mental health, um, they're called PMADS, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, never get treatment or help. Um, and so it's something that I want to bring more awareness to and am passionate about. And I want to focus more on that next year and hopefully, um, yeah, just doing stuff there. So if you want to follow me there, it's a small you have a YouTube account, channel too, but right? I have one video up on YouTube and six subscribers. All right. I'll leave the link so. below for that. And what's the name <laughs> of the YouTube channel again? It's just reclaiming mom brain. I love the name of it. That's so clever. So follow Eve on Instagram and YouTube. That's it. And that's it. And I'll leave the links in the description. If you're watching this later, come back. Um, again, that's a perfect plug for, yeah, things can get hard. Having babies, your brain chemistry changes. Feels like a whole whirlwind. I went through that hardcore. Our sons are both exactly the same age as well. So uh, we both had a rough time. You, you take the cake on having a rougher time than me. But man, I had a rough time as well. So that's a super important topic and cause that I would love to talk more about. And, Tomorrow night at Lake Effect while we're slosh. Just kidding. I don't drink anymore pretty much. Except for I had wine the other night on Christmas and that was delightful. But I'll just be dancing sober. Like a, it's a Mormon steak dance with you tomorrow night. But wine is disgusting. You haven't had Heinemann wine. Like my socks from my family's winery. So maybe your Why is your foot own in my face? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Anyway. Let's reclaim our mom brains. And uh, thank you again, Eve, for doing all of this, just putting up with me. And I'm just so excited that uh, you're on this this new kind of journey that I've forced you into. I take full responsibility. <laughs> Happy to be here. Uh, last super chat. I mean, not last one. First of many to come at this uh, late hour in my podcasting. Uh, thanks for the five bucks. Love watching your videos and shorts. Keep up the great investigative coverage. Thanks so much. Thank you guys for being here. It's just so important to do this as a live. I wanted to make sure that we got in as many questions and Eve could feel your love and support in real time. So thank you. Um, we love you. We are so grateful that you made that video and have to bring so much awareness out into the YouTube world and it just has so many good rippling effects. So thank you again, Eve. Thank you guys for watching. Obviously, like and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to support it, all of the links are down below. I have a fundraiser still to help me pay for the equipment that I bought to do in-person interviews like this going forward, in addition to everything else that I'm doing. I'm like a one-woman show in a lot of ways running this nonprofit and podcast. So I'm working hard, trying to make payroll, trying to make some, some money and some income here so I can... Uh, really say that my heart's trying to be in the right place to do all of this. So if you want to support this channel, you know where those links are and my Patreon, my support box, Kara, all of those things. We love Kara. We love Eve. So that's it from the, the mother and the, I'll be the father of all faith deconstruction. <laughs> all right. Take care guys. Love you so much. See ya. Bye.